Every sunset, rival soldiers lower the flag at the border between India and Pakistan. Fifty years ago, there was neither a border nor a Pakistan. The creation of a separate state for India's Muslims was largely the work of one man, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Jinnah you know, often told me, politics is like a game of chess. I asked him, do you play chess? He said, no, I play politics. Creators of nations are rare beings. And indeed, it's a remarkable situation that a man should start declaring that he wants to create Pakistan at the age of 60, and at 70, bring it into being. Jinnah lived to see his new country for barely a year. His body now rests in a splendid mausoleum built to honour the Qaidi Azam, or great leader, as he is known in Pakistan. But there was nothing in Jinnah's early years to suggest he might one day become the father of a nation. Muhammad Ali Jinnah was the son of a Muslim businessman from the Indian port of Karachi. In the early 1890s, he was sent to London to take up a business apprenticeship. But with the single-mindedness which would always mark his life, Jinnah defied his father's wishes and decided to study law at Lincoln's Inn. He did not like a business career because he disliked arithmetic. For a time, as a student, he worked in his father's office, but he left it because he disliked it. On the other hand, as a child, he had gone to the law courts in Karachi with his father and was very impressed with the various barristers who were wearing gowns and arguing cases. While in London, the young law student was inspired by Dadabhai Naroji, the first Indian to win a seat in the House of Commons and a keen believer that the people of British India should be given greater political freedom. Jinnah himself said at a later time uh, that he had learnt politics at the feet of Nairoji and also Jinnah said that he was inspired by Nairoji uh, that there was hope for Hindu-Muslim unity. On his return to India, Jinnah made his home in Bombay and built up a thriving practice as a high court lawyer. He also brought back from London a lasting taste for fine clothes and good living. Unlike his later political rivals, Gandhi and Nehru, Jinnah was never to adopt an austere appearance or way of life. The first time I met Mr. Jinnah, I noticed how immaculately dressed he was. He looked very handsome and he had a striking face which would impress anybody and who would like to talk to him if they ever met him. And uh, I was awed by him and I said, good Lord, he looks so much like an English gentleman. Jinnah was not a strict Muslim. He never wanted to be a strict Muslim. He never portrayed himself as a strict Muslim. He wanted to be known as a man of the world, an enlightened man, a man who enjoyed life. He was not abstemious. Oh, well, he smoked, he drank. He liked all the good things of life. Jinnah prospered in India, but he remained conscious of how his countrymen lacked political freedom under imperial rule. The British had granted Indians a measure of political representation, but the Raj remained very much in control. Encouraged by Naroji, Jinnah became a leading figure in the Indian National Congress, 
which was pushing for Indian self-government. Most Indians were Hindus, but Jinnah's fellow Muslims made up a significant minority. Congress was also mainly Hindu, and the Muslims had formed their own party, the Muslim League, and persuaded the British to grant them separate political representation. Jinnah was both a Muslim leaguer and a congressman. His efforts to get both parties to work together led him to be called the Ambassador of Hindu-Muslim Unity. Hindus and Muslims, united and firm, the voice of the 300 millions of people vibrating throughout the length and breadth of the country will produce a force which no power on earth can resist. Jinnah's dream came closer when he brought Congress and the League together in the city of Lucknow to sign an historic pact. The Lucknow Pact is an achievement for Muhammad Ali Jinnah because it concludes uh, his efforts to bring the Muslim League and the Congress on the same platform. It also represents an achievement because uh, in 1916 at Lucknow the Congress accepts uh, separate electorates, something it had been very reluctant to do. Separate electorates for Muslims had been granted in 1909 and the Congress always argued that this was um, aimed at dividing the Indian nation. So in 1916 with Jinnah's assistance they're able to agree to separate electorates and thereby create the conditions for the Muslims to stand together with the Congress um, in the nationalist movement. However, the Lucknow Pact was overtaken by events as the empire hardened its line against the nationalists. Jinnah strongly believed in constitutional methods of protest, but many nationalists thought more extreme tactics were now required. Jinnah found himself eclipsed by another London-trained barrister called Mohandas K. Gandhi, who was to tower over Indian politics and take the freedom struggle in a radically new direction. Gandhi invited Indians uh, to disobey certain laws of the Raj. Jinnah thought this was taking too big a risk, that this could invite chaos. Gandhi felt that he could control and train his people, but Jinnah was doubtful. For the first time ever, Hindus and Muslims seemed ready to undergo hardships, to risk imprisonment, uh, and to join together in a thrust for independence from the Raj. Uh, and Congress's leaders felt they had no choice except to follow Gandhi. Out of step with Congress, Jinnah fell back on the support and friendship of India's Muslim elite, such as the wealthy landowner, the Maharaja of Mahmudabad. But as the Maharaja's young son, Amir Ahmed Khan, found out, Jinnah was still very much the nationalist. He asked him a question which intimidated my father greatly. And the question was, are you a Muslim first or an Indian first? And my father, after pausing for a few seconds, uh, answered that he was a Muslim first. Mr. Jinnah then said, think again and tell me whether you're a Muslim first or an Indian first. My father again answered more emphatically that he was a Muslim first. At which point Mr. Jinnah looked even more displeased and he said, think again. At which point my father burst into tears and had to be taken away. By 1928, Congress was dominated by Jawaharlal Nehru, another figure who would play a central role in India's future. Nehru's father, Motilal, was compiling a report on political demands to put to the British. Hoping to recapture the spirit of the Lucknow Pact, Jinnah travelled to a meeting in Calcutta and offered Nehru Muslim backing in return for political safeguards. But Nehru wasn't interested. The Congress, under Nehru's influence, doesn't any longer believe that they need to approach Muslims through a Muslim political middleman, which is how Jinnah sees himself, which is how any Muslim politician in the Congress had seen himself, as someone delivering Muslims. Now, under a radicalized Nehru, under a socialist Nehru, the Congress wants to approach Muslims directly, without a middle person. So they see no reason why they should deal with Jinnah at all. Jinnah was devastated because the Nehru report had repudiated the constitutional safeguards which the Lucknow Pact had granted 
the Muslims. On the following day, when we left by train, a friend who saw him off afterwards related that he had tears in his eyes and he said, this is the parting of ways. Jinnah's political despair was followed by a personal tragedy just a few weeks later, with the death of his young wife, Rutti, on her 29th birthday. Mr. Jinnah was informed in New Delhi about her death, and he came to Bombay, and my mother-in-law was sitting with the body after prep all preparations had been made for a funeral, and she said, that Zubeda, never in my life have I ever seen a man weep the way he wept for his wife. Jinnah now decided to leave Bombay for London, where he set up home with his sister Fatima and young daughter Dina and practiced as a barrister at the Privy Council. It would be nearly four years before he would be persuaded to return to India. By 1937, Muslims made up nearly a quarter of India's huge population. In the northwest and northeast of the country, Muslims were in a majority, but nationally, they were still greatly outnumbered by Hindus. Following provincial elections that year, the Indian National Congress was able to form ministries in eight provinces. Jinnah was now the president of the All India Muslim League, after its members had pleaded with him to return. He hoped that Congress would offer the League a share of power after the elections. Flushed with success, Congress pressed ahead on its own. 1937 and the elections that happened are absolutely pivotal. To put it boldly, Jinnah and the League discover that minority safeguards don't work. You can have reserved seats for the Muslims out of proportion with their population in the Muslim minority districts. You can have separate electorates to make sure that only the Muslim politicians Muslims want get elected. But this still doesn't guarantee you a share of cabinet power. Even in the provinces where Muslims did make up a majority of the population, such as Bengal in the east and the Punjab, Frontier and Sindh in the west, the League's performance was poor. Jinnah's party just wasn't registering on India's political map. The emphasis was on local and provincial. Um, politics. Those were the arenas that the British uh, permitted Indians to make uh, an impact. Uh, and with separate electorates, which had been granted in 1909 for Muslims, uh, Muslim uh, politicians who were primarily landlords had no need for a party either at the provincial or the All India level to seek election. They could just use their local clout to um, uh, win elections within uh, protected Muslim constituencies. Jinnah now gathered the Muslim League in Lucknow and began a far-reaching overhaul of the party. His first step was to convince Sikandar Hyat Khan, the powerful chief minister of the Punjab, that the leaders of Muslim-majority provinces should back Jinnah so he could fight for their interests at an all-India level. For the first time in public, Jinnah also adopted a more consciously Muslim form of dress, a cap and a sharwani coat. His PR men, they said, let the crowd feel that you are one of them and that you are not a Saab, you are not an Englishman. Because you look like an Englishman, you dress like an Englishman. And it doesn't fit in with what you are trying to achieve. So for God's sake, wear it. And he was practical enough to say, well, right, I'll wear it. Membership of the League soon began to swell as a result of Jinnah's reorganization and the growing resentment of Congress's provincial ministries, which were seen as anti-Muslim. The League was now attracting support from all quarters of India's Muslim population. The educated women joined Muslim League 
because they were convinced that when we work with the with the men shoulder to shoulder we will get our educational rights our legal rights our political rights our religious rights uh, to tell you the truth for your information that religion has given us lot of rights but they are not implemented Jinnah's followers now hailed him as their Qaidi Azam, or great leader. But not all the Muslims were convinced by his claim that they were treated as second-class citizens by the Hindu-dominated Congress ministries. If we felt a second-class citizen, if we felt unequal, that is vis-à-vis -vis the British establishment and not against the Hindus. Because as a matter of fact, when I started and then I joined politics, I was welcomed by the Hindus that, oh, here is a Muslim who is coming in our ranks. So I was welcomed and probably um, uh, they favored me more than the other people simply because I was Muslim. But for the Qaidi Azam, simple acceptance by Congress was now no longer enough. Jinnah decides that so long as you present yourself as a minority, you will always be treated unequally or with condescension and patronage. The only way to make the Congress listen, and even more importantly than the Congress, make the British listen, because after all, the British are in charge, and it's only what they say goes. The only way to do this is to claim equality. Jinnah now argued that the Muslims weren't a minority, but were in fact an entire nation. Hindus and Muslims were two nations sharing the landmass of India and they should therefore share its government. Jinnah's closest advisers, such as the businessman Sir Abdullah Haroon, now tried to convince him that the logical development of the two-nation theory was independence for India's Muslim-majority provinces. All the industries were based in the Hindu dominated India. But the raw materials were always produced either in Punjab, either in Sindh, or either in uh, Frontier. And my father's argument was that one should have its own economic sphere and economic uh, line of action. And the economy could only benefit people living in majority provinces if. They, they had separated from India. Jinnah unveiled his grand scheme to the Muslim League at a mass gathering in the Punjab city of Lahore. On the 23rd March 1940, there was a multitude of people from all quarters of this country. There were camps surrounding this stage. On this stage was Qaidism and the great luminaries in the country, the great scholars, from different provinces. When he commenced uh, his address, uh, he became a source of excitement, his leadership. So when we heard, his every word was uh, piercing and penetrating uh, in our hearts. That resolution of the 23rd, which was known as Lahore Resolution, when it was read by Qadi Azam, there was great enthusiasm. People were all jubilant. There was life to see. They were all excited. What has come today? Uh, the plea was that they were declared a nation. The Lahore Resolution demanded that areas in which Muslims were in a majority, as in the northwestern and eastern zones of India, should be grouped to constitute independent states, in which the constituent units would be autonomous and sovereign. The hope was that uh, once uh, these provinces were grouped together, Mr. Jinnah might be able to use their weight at the All India level to extract some concessions from the Congress and the British and also in the process uh, safeguard the interests of Muslims living in the minority provinces. The Lahore Resolution soon became known as the Pakistan Resolution after the name which had been invented for a Muslim homeland. Although the resolution itself mentioned neither Pakistan nor the partitioning of India. But Pakistan caught the imagination of India's Muslims. 
and the coming years would see the League organise itself with increasing militancy against a background of growing violence between Hindus and Muslims. Jinnah himself was accused of whipping up religious hysteria. Mr. Jinnah did say that Islam is in danger. I heard him speak in a meeting in Kanpur, an industrial town in northern India. He was addressing a gathering of the Muslims in public meeting and he did say that Islam is in danger. And I really was afraid that this type of his speech might lead to Hindu-Muslim clashes. Yet Jinnah was resisting pressure from many of his supporters who were demanding the creation of an Islamic state. Amongst them was Amir Ahmed Khan, the Raja of Mahmudabad, who as a boy had displeased Jinnah by saying he was a Muslim first and an Indian second. My father made a statement to the effect that Pakistan would be an Islamic state, a state in which the Islamic Sharia would be practiced. Mr. Jinnah was in total disagreement with this and let it be known to my father uh, quite plainly that he dissociated in every way with the statement that my father had made to the press and that he did not agree at all with this view. In fact, he went on to say to my father that he uh, could not envisage a situation where the, Shari the law, the Sharia law, would be used as a model for making the constitution of Pakistan, which would be a modern state in the modern world. World events had now given Jinnah a strong hand. When World War II broke out in 1939, the British took India into the war without consulting any Indian politicians. In outrage, Congress resigned all its provincial ministries. Once war is declared, Jinnah has a whole new world open to him, simply because the Congress decides on principle to resign the ministries. So what you have is this huge political vacuum. You have nobody in power in these provinces. Since Jinnah is seen by the British as now in control of the ruling parties in the Punjab and in Bengal, especially the Punjab, because Punjab is very important from the point of view of troops and the Indian army, the British now feel compelled to deal with Jinnah. During the war years, Jinnah became an increasingly frequent visitor in the corridors of British power and earned a formidable reputation as an unyielding negotiator. I found him aloof, reserved, but still quite frank. Uh, he didn't seem to me to be holding things back, putting on a front. I found this admirable in him. What I found a little alarming was his uh, his refusal to budge an inch from some goal that he'd set himself. In August 1942, Congress launched Quit India, a civil disobedience movement aimed at forcing the British to hand over power. A harsh crackdown by the authorities left thousands of Congress supporters and its leadership in jail. Jinnah denounced Quit India as a dangerous mass movement. He had recently been encouraged when the British emissary, Sir Stafford Cripps, made a statement that some Indian provinces might, in the future, form a separate union of their own. It didn't offer a separate division of India into Pakistan and the rest, but we can perceive historically so it was so that that was when, from the British government's point of view, it actually conceded the possibility or the probability of a Pakistan. Congress had also realised that it had to take Jinnah seriously. After his release from prison, Gandhi met Jinnah at his home in an attempt to heal the rift between Congress and the League. It appeared that the Mahatma was now prepared to contemplate a very limited Pakistan. But it was too limited for Jinnah. 
Gandhi had said that all Muslim majority areas if those areas by a plebiscite wanted to secede and form a separate state, they might be allowed to do so. Jinnah said that was not good enough. He also wanted the whole of the Punjab, including East Punjab. He wanted West Bengal. He also wanted Assam. And Gandhi felt it was unnatural for Muslim minority areas to be included in any Pakistan. Jinnah refused to accept what he called a mutilated and moth-eaten Pakistan. He didn't want just the parts of the provinces where Muslims were in a majority. But by holding out, Jinnah was taking a big gamble. Now in his late 60s, only his closest family knew how frail he really was. Jinnah was, by that time, already a very sick person. In fact, his sister tells us that he began to get colds and coughs in 1927 because he was a heavy smoker. And in 1934, when he resumed charge of the Muslim League, he had a stroke and was unconscious for five days. And in 44, he was even more ill because as time passed, his health deteriorated. The opportunity Jinnah had been waiting for came the following year when after unsuccessful talks between the different parties, the British Viceroy, Lord Wavell, announced that fresh elections would be held in India over the winter of 1945. Jinnah immediately declared that the elections would be nothing less than a referendum for Pakistan. The right to vote was still limited to a fraction of India's population. But Jinnah was determined to spread the word as widely as possible. अपने खुद मुख्तार हो मांगे अपने आजाद हो मांगे साड़ा मलक आपना हो जिस तरह हर कोई मलक आ चाहना है अमेरिका ब्रिटानिया रूस इंडिया इस तरह इंसानों में खुश The league went on to gain nearly three quarters of all Muslim votes, vindicating Jinnah's claim that Muslim electors backed the Pakistan demand. With fresh urgency, Sir Stafford Cripps returned to Delhi with two other cabinet ministers to try to solve the Pakistan question while preserving the unity of India. The cabinet mission proposed that separate Hindu and Muslim federations should be formed, each being represented in a central government with limited powers. Real power would be concentrated at the federal and provincial levels and the provinces would also have the right to break away from the centre after 10 years. Jinnah wasn't being offered an immediate sovereign Pakistan, but he chose to accept the proposals. Jinnah was ready to adopt the cabinet mission because he felt that they would get a better deal and that within 10 years, if the Indians do not behave with the majority provinces, then they had the opportunity of part, uh, partis uh, parting with India um, on a question of referendum. And referendum would be only held in the majority provinces. Did this mean he was prepared to settle for less than a sovereign Pakistan? Yes, that was the idea. And the sovereign Pakistan would not be there till the Muslims felt that they were not getting a fair deal, and then the partition of India would come about. Congress also went on to accept the plan, but its leadership was determined India should have a strong central government. Shortly afterwards, Nehru said in a speech that once India had sovereign independence, it could do what it liked with its own constitution, implying that Congress could use its majority to reverse terms favourable to the League. 
Nehru's remarks stunned the Muslim League, which decided it now had no option but to reject the Cabinet mission's proposals and resort to direct action to achieve Pakistan. For Jinnah, this was a grave and dangerous new strategy. You see, you have to understand Jinnah's background. He was a born, absolutely born Democrat. He did not believe in the hunger strikes, the fast into death. He had won his way through sheer argument and, uh, and the weight of his argument. That's why he said, if I threaten, this will, might break the ice. And he threatened. The League now held a direct action day. In Calcutta, Muslim demonstrators were confronted by Hindus. Order was only restored after three days of violence and thousands of deaths. Jinnah was very upset. He said, Shokat, I didn't know that I'll bring such misery to my people. Jinnah could not conceivably have anticipated the scale of the Calcutta killings, nor for that matter could he have wanted the violence which broke out. As a constitutionalist, he needed some sort of an atmosphere in which he could negotiate an arrangement with the Congress and the British, which would enable him to secure his interests, uh, and certainly the interests of his constituents in the Muslim-majority provinces, and certainly in a way that he would be able to provide Muslims in the minority provinces with some sort of safeguards. So the violence actually seriously undermines his strategy. It exposes his lack of control. An increasingly desperate Jinnah flew to London for talks, but he was determined not to give anything away. I am on my mission, and I can tell you nothing about it at present. That's all I can say. The talks went nowhere. It was becoming clear that the British wanted to get out of India as quickly as possible, and would not be keen to stay on and umpire any future settlement between the different parties. To bring matters to a speedy conclusion, Lord Louis Mountbatten was sent to Delhi in March 1947 to become the last Viceroy of India. His key task was to get the leaders to reach some sort of an agreement which they would be prepared to underwrite and accept. The deadlock had to be ended, but of course transferring power isn't an easy process. And you have to get people to be prepared to accept it and to, and to accept compromises which all for the whole of their careers they had been avoiding. The Mountbatten's found it easy to communicate with the urbane Nehru, but there was little love lost between them and Jinnah, who famously described this press appearance as showing a rose between two thorns. It was unclear whether this was just a slip of the tongue. Mountbatten finally got Congress and the Cabinet in London to agree to a plan for partition. Congress conceded the partition of India, provided Jinnah accepted the partition of the Muslim-majority provinces. Bengal and the Punjab would each be cut into two, with their Muslim-majority areas becoming part of Pakistan, a country in two halves on either side of India. It was a similar proposal to the one Jinnah had flatly rejected as mutilated and moth-eaten in his discussions with Gandhi less than three years before. But his room to manoeuvre was limited. So Mountbatten said to him, look, I'm not prepared to, to play with words now. We, we're, we're facing a position, if you don't show some, some readiness to accept, you'll never get another chance to present your case. Jinnah returned to the Viceroy's house at midnight and told Lord Mountbatten he would have to consult the Council of the Muslim League before he could give his acceptance. Mountbatten wasn't prepared to wait. He said, all I shall want from you on the day is that you nod your head when I say that I would feel justified in, in recommending the British government to go ahead. On the 3rd of June, the leaders returned, having met the previous day, with their 
formal decision. The Congress indicated acceptance of the plan. When it came to Jinnah's turn, he played the game as he had been asked to do. When Mountbatten put the question to him, Jinnah nodded his head affirmatively, and so it was that Pakistan came into existence on the Nod. We must remember that we have to take momentous decisions and handle grave issues facing us in the solution of the complex political problem. The Mountbatten partition plan was not acceptable to the younger generation of the council and the working committee. And some of us felt that there should be a direct action in order to achieve our goal. But Jinnah was very strong. He had the support of more influential people than us. Well, it was a defeat, yet it was a victory. He was defeated in his full claim. And he, had to, he was poor, forced to accept a smaller Pakistan. But he got the Pakistan. In Jinnah's birthplace of Karachi, frantic work now began to turn the town into the new capital of Pakistan. Jinnah, meanwhile, made preparations to leave Delhi for the last time. There was no ceremony, it was a quite departure. And uh, he took his seat uh, uh, somewhere in the middle of the airplane, on the left-hand side. And uh, I was sitting just, just behind him. Uh, the pilot started testing out for a takeoff, and uh, as he opened the throttles, and the aircraft gathered speed, and it lost touch with the ground, Mr. Jinnah said to himself, that's the end of it. But as the wind of change blew through the Punjab, Jinnah's struggle was to prove far from over. Pakistan was officially born at midnight on the 14th of August, 1947. It was the fifth largest state in the world. Now installed as the country's first governor general, Jinnah had got at least part of what he wanted. But while the celebrations went on, tensions in the border areas of India and Pakistan reached fever pitch. A frenzy of ethnic violence began with the Punjab worst hit. Millions fled their homes in a massive refugee movement as Muslims headed for Pakistan and Hindus and Sikhs for India. The subcontinent has never seen violence of these genocidal proportions before. Right up to the end, Jinnah and the Muslim leaguers on the one hand, and Nehru and Gandhi and the Congress on the other, were urging Muslims and Hindus to stay where they were. But of course, it was unrealistic to believe that once the violence started, people wouldn't begin to flee towards populations they thought were more sheltered. And once that began, the violence just followed in its way. The Bekatan we carry in the Ajedanal, Toe, Musalona, Pani Kada, Barsia, Yadi, Lasha Vekia, Badia Vekia, but Boo on this Yotu, Erdi, dear Pulu Polake, Kubatiania, Kujanani, Kubanda, Marda, Hosti. Refugee trains were attacked in both directions. Carriages full of corpses crossed the border into Pakistan and arrived at Lahore railway station. We were feeling very helpless. Now the dead bodies are coming in. What are we going to do about it? So as a necessary step, we allowed that a one uh, train full of dead bodies of non-Muslims should be sent to India. We collected them from different places and we massacred them also. We killed them also. I don't want to lie about it that we didn't kill. We also, as a deterrent measure, you had to do one thing to stop 
smash the Quran. Faizyazam did come here in Lahore and uh, visited the refugee camps. And uh, when he saw their situation, I mean, some people with their cut off limbs and cut off other faces and all types of things, he, he, a person like that, a strong willed man like him, he had tears in, in his eyes. Pakistan was still barely coping with the flood of refugees when a new crisis arose. At the time of partition, the princely state of Kashmir, which bordered Pakistan and India, had not chosen which country to accede to. The population was mainly Muslim, but its ruler was Hindu. Many in Pakistan feared that this strategic piece of land might become part of India. I told Mr. Jinnah that it was a must for the Punjab to have Kashmir on our side because without the water of uh, uh, Kashmir and the rivers flowing through Kashmir, Pakistan would have been sunk. Did Jinnah actually say to you, invade Kashmir? Of course. No one could move, not a, uh, a leaf could move in those days without Jena's blessings. A large band of guerrillas from Pakistan's tribal areas attempted to overrun Kashmir. Indian troops were airlifted in to repel them. Jinnah tried to order his military commander, General Gracie, to organize a full-scale invasion of the state. But both the Indian and Pakistan armies were being run by British officers. Well, Gracie's position was, was quite clear. He simply warned Mr. Jinnah that if a situation developed whereby there was a warlike situation and British officers were being called upon to fight each other, they wouldn't do so. They would be, they would be taken away. And they, this was an unacceptable situation, one, one which couldn't, couldn't be envisaged. And, and, I mean, Jinnah accepted this. So there was no, nothing he could do about it. They, 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 wouldn't, they simply would not fight each other. A ceasefire was eventually brokered, but the conflict has carried on without resolution to the present day. Frail and elderly, Jinnah now faced an enormous workload which he refused to delegate. His motto was work, work and work. And he really did what he preached. He was working from morning till evening. And uh, there was no rest even in the afternoon. In spite of our efforts to wean him away from uh, hard work, he wouldn't listen because uh, he was a man of his own uh, decisions and nobody could change his uh, mind about it. One of the reasons Jinnah failed to delegate seemed to be his lack of confidence in his own ministers. Jinnah had wanted my father to form a very large Pakistani shipping company and he had helped him do that. So when things were not moving as fast as Jinnah felt they should, he asked my father, what is your problem? At which point my father told him that you got the damn fool for a minister who was in charge of shipping. He's our stumbling block. We can't, he's thick. We can't get things through. So Jinnah said, well, it's no good criticizing him. I had a great job getting this bunch of six ministers together. This is what we've got to work with. The combination of stress and Jinnah's already poor health was taking its toll. I was leading a delegation of ladies to meet Mr. Jinnah and I had to garland him. And when I was putting the garland, he took the garland from my hands and my hand to his hand I touched. And I, I noticed that his hand was as cold as ice. And then I realized that uh, he is not a um, healthy person, because a healthy person can't be so cold. In the summer of 1948, his health failing, Jinnah went to convalesce at the remote Pakistani hill station of Zirat. 
His sister Fatima would recall how he felt at peace among the fruit trees and flowers. But by September, Jinnah was fighting pneumonia, tuberculosis and cancer of the lungs. His doctors urged that he should be flown back to Karachi. Fatima ordered an ambulance to collect her brother from the airport, but to avoid a panic did not say that he would be the passenger. The ambulance had barely gone four miles before it broke down. Now mortally ill, Jinnah was left lying in the back of the vehicle for more than an hour before a replacement arrived. Finally, Jinnah was brought back to the Governor General's mansion. A few hours later, he was dead. We went to the government house and um, there was Miss Jenna sitting uh, with a table lamp on and uh, in the next room the body of Mr. Jenna was lying on bed and I went there, the nurse was there and she showed me his face and I can't uh, describe how I was feeling, my eyes were full of tears and I couldn't even read the uh, Quran which was lying uh, there. I saw him in the bed lying and I saw that he was going to leave us and pass away from this world and what will happen next. Who would become the leader, who would become in charge of the uh, country and whether the solidarity of country would remain as such. Because we had East Pakistan, we had West Pakistan and my thoughts were Jinnah had worked so hard and there he lay lying lifeless without telling us as to what next. Although death cheated him out of creating a constitution, Jinnah had offered this vision of Pakistan's future. If you change your past and work together in the spirit that every one of you no matter to what community he belongs, is first, second and last a citizen of this state with equal rights, you will find that in the course of time Hindus would cease to be Hindus and Muslims would cease to be Muslims, not in the religious sense, because that is the personal faith of each individual, but in the political sense as citizens of the state. Jinnah's clarion call for a tolerant and forward-looking Pakistan has often gone unheeded during the five decades since his death. But as the hundreds who make the pilgrimage to his mausoleum every day will testify, for Pakistanis from all walks of life, Jinnah remains the father of the nation.